So I think the topic of this is going to be something to do with general philosophy of the European Union, whether you like it, what, what you like about it, what you don't like about it, mm -hmm. um, why you voted as you did in, in, in 2016. Um, because you guys are relatively young. I mean, you're in your 20s, are you? Or? 27. Yeah, yeah. And you're 32. 32. Um, so it's interesting to get you guys' opinion because you're meant to be a Remainers, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so according to some, according to some. So Ben, why, why did you vote to leave in 2016? Uh, I, I think in terms of the reasons I personally voted, um, it, it wasn't about so much what I what I see in the campaign, and I've I've had a desire, should I say, to leave the European Union before there was even talk of a referendum. All um, oh, right, and it was purely because I I was working in Europe, travelling, uh, and I've just become interested in. For example, how it is I can cross the border between France and Belgium in my car and not have to stop and and speak to somebody or tell them where I'm going and show them my passport. Yeah. Um, and seeing the the old border checks being dismantled and things like that uh, yeah. as I travel across Europe. Um, so I developed, I'd say I developed a keen interest in how all of that worked. Um, and I was still quite young, obviously, at the time. So my my interest in politics was only was only still very new. Um, I thought it was great. I thought the idea that people could uh, travel across borders freely, especially in the Benelux area, which is Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, um, and then obviously into Germany and France, I thought the idea you could freely move, there was no checks, delays, should I say, at borders. Um, everything seemed to be in line with each other, um, and it all seemed very good on the, on the face of it. Um, and then I started digging into how historically the European Union come about. How it, uh, how it evolved, should I say, into what it is today. Um, and I noticed, I think, uh, from not just our perspective, but in many cases across Europe, there was a lack of democratic process in place that, um, whereby such control had been consolidated, should I say, to Brussels or to the ECJ in Luxembourg or, or whatever it would be. Um, I didn't feel that the European Union had pursued the correct avenues in ensuring that member states uh, actually showed the, the, the sorry the citizens of member states actually showed a keen interest in becoming part of this ever closer union that has been built over time. So your problem was really with the democratic deficit and political union, basically. Yeah, so I think as time developed, I think we could use the United Kingdom as an example. We were signed up to the single market, I think, uh, 73, was it 73? Yeah. Insofar as it existed, the single market properly existed post-92, but the, yes. the foundations of it, yes. The founder, yeah, so I, when we were signed up originally, uh, we then had a vote afterwards, I understand, in 75. 75, yeah, yeah. Um, which was fine. That's a democratic process. Great. But I think since then we've had multiple treaties, Maastricht, uh, more recently the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and, and I recall that in 2005 the Labour Party ran on a, on a manifesto promise that they would hold a referendum on the About matter. The, um, on the Lisbon European Treaty. European Constitution. I think it was the European yes, Constitution. Was called, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it was a European Constitution which France, I think Ireland and the Netherlands also uh, rejected. Voted against, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was, from my perspective, from, from my view, that just seemed to be edited slightly and then rushed through. As a um, renamed Lisbon Treaty. Renamed the Lisbon Treaty, and it all sounds very fancy. Um, and come 2008, we were signed in. There was no democratic mandate, in my opinion, um, for elements of our sovereignty to be transferred over to Brussels. Um, and from, from, I suppose, from having a more business background, it would also it would somewhat feel that MPs have outsourced their jobs oh, right. to Brussels, yeah. um, and they haven't really sought the democratic mandate from the general public to do so. What do you think, Patrick? On that point, I would largely agree. I think yes, that 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 has been. I think it was one of the turning points and one of the more major turning points in public opinion, beginning to shift towards a realization that actually these things, these changes, such as Lisbon, will be steamrolled through, whether people want them or not. Mm. And I expect that for a lot of people that will have been the beginning or close to the beginning mm. of the evolution of their belief that actually this isn't really something that's very us. 
in a lot of ways, if you see what I mean, British. What do you mean by that? <laughs> but that's not the way that I mean, it was, we would it was, want this country to work. But our, our betters, if you will, mm. in the Parliament over there wanted it to work that way. They must have our interests at heart. We live in a representative democracy. Well, I'm, so, I'm certainly not totally against uh, the idea of representative democracy. It's, it's how a lot of things have to work. But I think when you are almost misleading the people in the sense that you are promising, as many governments do promise many things and they then don't do, but if you are promising the people that these huge changes won't be made unless they give consent to it, mm. and then you fail to implement that, right. in a manner that actually in some ways mirrors what goes on in Brussels, what goes on in the rest of Europe, what went on in France, Ireland, the Netherlands. I, I can imagine that people's beliefs may well have started to shift if they weren't already in that direction at roughly that point. I certainly, I took note of that. Yeah. I wouldn't have predicted back then that this was what was going to happen, that we were going to have a referendum organised yeah. on membership of the EU at all. Yeah. But certainly ideas were fermenting in my mind at the time. Triggered so what, the rise of UKIP. Didn't well, it, in some ways, as, as, as time went on, it UKIP become such a... They, all those forces were around mm. at, the, at the time, but yes, I can see it being a triggering point mm. to a degree, yes. I mean, it, it was kind of that perfect storm of YouTube, Nigel Farage, <laughs> the Social European media. elections in 2014 yeah. or whenever yes. it was, um, where they won it. But what happened, right? So there was the European constitution that was being formed in the early 2000s, wasn't there? Um, Labour, I think you mentioned, had a platform where they promised that they would have a, was it a referendum on the European it would be a Constitution? But they kind of didn't have to fulfil that because it mm. was binned by the European Union before they had an opportunity to do yes. that. Is that what happened? I, 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 from, from my understanding of it, um, it was, I wouldn't say it was binned, but I would say perhaps elements of it changed and uh, I think some texts were added to the Lisbon I mean, Treaty was, and it was, I, I it was kind argue, of rebranded in would, some way. Essentially, yes, rebranded. Yes. I would argue it was a fairly superficial rewrite that we were going to stop using the, this idea of a flag or an, or, or an anthem or we were stop calling it a constitution, mm. basically. But there wasn't a great deal of fundamental difference. Um, and so that was the kind of weasel way, the te technicality that Labour kind of got out of. The, and and, and the EU as well. And, the, and, and I, th I, think, I think, yes, as you say, the weasel words... I, I think that is how it was perceived, that this was a fudge to, to get it through. They were going to do it regardless. Yeah. They needed to make the changes that they needed to make, however superficial they were, to get people to believe it was okay. And that's what they did. They didn't take fundamental notice of the fact that people wanted changes, which means fundamental changes. It doesn't mean a few tweaks here and there. Yeah. Although, of course, interestingly, we could draw that back to the withdrawal agreement, couldn't we? That, that, that uh, what, what the ERG wants now and what the other factions in Parliament want now is fundamental changes yeah. to that. And instead, all we're seeing even our own elected representatives doing over in Brussels is trying to negotiate these fairly minor tweaks because that's all the EU will allow. Once it's agreed something, and it has a history of this, once it's agreed something at that level, it will not allow that to be fundamentally reopened, fundamentally altered, only tweaked with the notion of getting it past a democracy in a member state. So I see nothing new here going on versus what went on with mm. so that it's got referendum. The, the that same was not personality it's always had since 92 when the European Union was created. Yes, yeah. I mean, one thing that struck me is that um, the, the point that you mentioned about the ability to change after you've made a decision to go back and revisit it and, and possibly either undo or, 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 or change it. That seems to, the, the European Union seems to be designed to be a ratchet. You know what I mean? Something's, something's enacted and then it's put into law and then there's no strong or, or effective way for, for people to affect democratic change to mm. that. I mean, what, do you have an opinion on that? Or? I would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, the EU has been described as the steamroller by some. Right. Um, the changes will be, will be steamrolled through, mm. whether people are really very comfortable with them or not. And I think that is what we're seeing here. When we look at, the, when we look at that from a philosophical point of view, this, there is this whole setup, this whole way of working that seems to be in the favour of these elites who will make these decisions without any real trust in the populace to decide whether they are acceptable or not. Yeah. Now, 
this sort of brings me back a bit to philosophical texts that you can read as The Republic by Plato. And Plato is describing this concept in there of the philosopher kings, which is a concept envisioned by Socrates. Yeah. Socrates, for those who don't know, is he's a bit like Jesus in the Bible. He didn't write anything himself, but he figures in the narrative of other texts by Plato, Xenophon, a couple of others. And Socrates was not a fan of democracy at all. He, to be fair, he was a calm, reasonable, rational man in a mad world of ancient Greece. And he, well, the way he wanted things to be was that the world, or Greece or Athens, would be led by these philosopher kings, these people who are trained to be rulers. The leaders, yeah. Leaders. Yeah. And that the right way to do it was to have those people, to, to bring them up that way, and that they should take the decisions. He feared this idea, really, of, of democracy. Now, what's interesting about the way that Plato was writing that was that at the time, Plato was a very bitter man at that time because of what ultimately happened to Socrates. They killed him. They poisoned him. Or well, they forced him to take poison himself because his ideas were too radical, or what we might call too sensible. So, Socr so wait a second. Socrates was advocating a technocracy, essentially. And how did Plato fit into this? Plato was a was a follower. You might call him a disciple of Socrates. Yeah. He very much agreed with these findings, and when they killed him. He became, in his later years, this very bitter man okay. who saw no benefit in, in the demos, making decisions whatsoever, because of what they'd done to his, his master, you know, his, 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 okay. his, his leader. And so when he was writing this, there is this cynicism, a very deep cynicism that you can read into it, um, about human beings and the way they behave, the way they ought to be ruled. Yeah. And I see that cynicism really at the heart of the European Union. If we, look, if we look at it in the aftermath of World War II, I mean, at that time, twice in 50 years, Europe had gone to war, devastating wars, the like of which we hadn't seen before. And I can understand that at that point, people were thinking, look, we can't trust the people. We've got to draw things together in such a way that we remove that choice and indeed that accountability, and we have these people, I don't think they were necessarily referring to Plato's Republic, but I see the same idea, 2,000 years later, I see the same thing so going on. they're modelling it on similar philosophical I, I, lines? I, say, I don't think they are directly modelling no, it on no, no, that, no, but no, I but see one thing there 2,000 years ago, I see another one 70 years ago, and actually this cynicism that it's founded upon, which they think is positivity, they think is progress, mm. but actually to try and build a model of progress that is based upon a fundamental precept that you cannot trust the peoples of different countries to make democratic decisions, yeah. I don't call that progress. Mm. What do you think, Ben? I mean, do you think that people should be trusted with big decisions, like, for example, leaving a political union, you know, pan pan European political union? I, I think it. I think it's. I think it could vary, uh, very much so, uh, on culture, um, on. Uh, traditionally, I suppose you could uh, use the United Kingdom as an example. As, yes. as, a, as a united kingdom, it has in many ways been quite a strong democratic force that's progressed freedom and democracy. It's like a mini European Union, isn't it? Almost as, <laughs> almost as such, but um, I, I, I'm, not too, um, I'm not too knowledgeable on the, on the philosophy side of things, but right. I, I think what Patrick was describing actually, um, just listening just now, it does actually quite very much reflect the model that the European Union might well be uh, quite uh, closely aligned with. Yeah. Um, I, I think he's right, and when, in terms of when he says that it's not directly modelled on that philosophy, no. or even um, that the European Union may have even looked at and followed that philosophy at all, um, it could well be that 2,000 years later, somebody or the group of people, whoever they might be, um, have come up with this. They ended up with the same thinking. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> they've 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 uh, they've developed this idea that well, since we've had two big wars, you know, obviously Europe can't be trusted. Um, mm. And I don't think 
I, I, I don't think it could necessarily be wrong um, in some cases, because if you look at countries like Germany in the early 20th century, yeah, it was allied with the, the, the wrong people, should we say, and that went on to progress to <laughs> Hitler. <Just> careful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, if you look at um, certain aspects um, of the early 20th century, we had the Armenian massacre, and there were issues in Germany at that time. Um, and I think, I think, I don't dismiss that the European Union has done good to uh, create unity in Europe, but I don't think that the United Kingdom and the people of the United Kingdom really needed to be included in such uh, such a system because they couldn't be trusted to I see. run themselves. I think the Europe, I think the United Kingdom has had more of a well, we've had a stable democracy for a long time. Yeah, I think and, that's and you're the point saying I'm that, trying to... You're yeah, saying that to because of our history, we possibly have demonstrated that we can govern ourselves I think a lot of people without see being that in a political well. union. Yes. I think a lot of people see that as well. From May I just pick up on the point of, on unity? Mm. I, think, I think it's quite right to point out that there are some ways in which Europe is now more united than it was. There are also ways of saying, I'm not sure if it is. And I think there's a, there's a question there of, there's a definition of what is unity. Mm. Well, unity is people coming together to work in the common good through their own choice. Yes. If they are not doing so through choice, then I would say that is not union, that is mm. dominion. Yes. And actually, you know, th th this is why I have a problem with ever closer union as a, as a fundamental principle. Because what it actually creates is this homogeneity, mm. where we're removing differences, we're removing choice, we're flattening things out, we're spreading things out. And actually, when people are technically working together there, it isn't unity, yeah. because there is far less choice mm. Mm. going on. So Patrick, what are the arguments against Plato and, and, and Socrates? So, I mean, it seems to be two very highly educated people with big brains have come up with technocracy and, and said that you know that that's the way forward what's well, the argument against that what I okay uh, it's also um, interesting the exchange just earlier about um, should we have a referendum on that sort of thing or, or should we not yeah. if I can just answer by means of that I can deal with representative democracy where we do elect these people and they do make those decisions and we trust them to do so now I don't have a fundamental problem with that in terms of should we have had a referendum, I think the thing was, if, there, if it is clear, by whatever manner, that there is enough appetite in the country for there to actually be now some direct democracy, then I see that as no smoke without a fire. There is a reason for that. Mm. And then we should have a referendum, then we should engage with that. Do you, right. see what, you see what I'm trying to say? In terms of you know, what are the arguments against it, maybe it's a case of saying there's a time and a place for everything. Mm. There's a time and a place for representative democracy. Yeah. There's also a time and a place for direct democracy by means of a referendum yeah, or a, a plebiscite. And if it's clear that the mood is there in the country, the appetite is there in the country for actually on this particular issue a bit of direct democracy, well, our democracy is strong and old and robust enough to navigate those winds, to pick up on when that's the case, to then hold the referendum. And I want to say, to then enact the result. But I don't find myself sitting here opposite this building in particular and saying, I can actually finish that sentence and say <laughs> we are going to enact the result. Do, would you say that democracy is kind of a continuum, right? It's quite a nuanced thing, you know. Perhaps um, the European Union for us as levers is not offering enough direct democracy for our... For our it just doesn't allow room for it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's certain elements of direct democracy in the sense that you, you're d directly electing a party representative, aren't you? So you're, you're in in, the, in England, not forgetting Northern Ireland, but they've got a different mechanism. We use the Hon proportional representation system for electing MEPs. Mm. So in some sense, a direct democracy in the European Union. But I think, for me, the Parliament doesn't have enough democratic strength. May, um, may I pick up on that? Go on, go on. If we, if we just compare and contrast that to the system we have in the UK, yeah. so we have the House of Commons and we have the House of Lords, and the House of Commons is elected, and the House of Lords is appointed, yeah. and the House of Commons can propose, or well, the, the, the government, the executive, and also private members' bills, can propose legislation, debate it, they send it to the Lords, the Lords can amend it, 
they'll come back to the Commons and it can be enacted, hopefully. Now, if you look at the way that Europe works, it's kind of that system turned on its head, really. Mm. Because the only people who are elected, the Parliament, are not allowed to propose any new legislation. The only formally, people, no. no, formally, indeed, they can only amend. So it's a bit like saying in this country, if we had a House of Commons and a House well, of Lords, well, they can't even formally amend. They can just make recommendations. They can make suggestions, yes. Yeah, and yeah. It, but, but a lot of them are enacted. It's fair to it's fair to say that right. uh, they are accepted. But it's as though in this country, in this building over here, we had our Commons and we had our Lords, and only the Lords were allowed to propose laws. And I think if you are somebody who is actually interested in democracy. Yeah. then no one who was would ever even conceive of such a backward system, <laughs> never mind implement it and then tell a few fibs about what it actually means for democracy. Well, people are un unhappy enough about the House of Lords as it stands, right? If they were to invert it. <laughs> and yet that's what, you know, all yeah. the delegated competencies that the European Union has, mm. that's the way it works. And yet people seem to be happy about that. <laughs> there seems to be an inconsistency it's, there. It is exactly what you would do if you wanted to look democratic if you see what yeah. I mean. Mm. The Commission's up there and the EU Council is up there making, proposing the laws, coming up with the laws they're going to make and then proposing them. People are down here. I see the European Parliament, which is directly elected, as a sort of insulating layer between the rulers yeah. and the people. The people, when they look up, all they see is this insulating layer. Yeah. If yeah. you see what I mean. Yeah. It's exactly what you'd do if you wanted to look democratic. <laughs> What do you think, Ben? I agree with Patrick entirely um, oh, right, okay. on that on that <laughs> on that subject. It it does come across to a lot of people, and a lot of people I've spoken to, is that well, we have a commission whereby uh, we have a president, some laws. You've got the. I, I think also another aspect of it is actually a lot of people are interested in having their voices heard, but they don't always really care about how the system in depth really mm. works. Yeah. So what we've got at the moment, if you look at um, if you if you really take a step back and and you place yourself in the position of a you know somebody who goes to work nine to five every week votes at their elections, I don't necessarily think that they're really interested in having to elect an MEP, an MP, uh, a police commissioner. People have little time follow. for politics. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that a lot of people don't really want to have to have so much bureaucracy, so much voting. So it's almost like there's. In, in some ways, you could strangely say that there's too much democracy, but actually, it doesn't. It still doesn't give the person the voice that they think that having. they think that they have. In yeah. some ways, it's it's all it's almost. I want. I think it's a faux democracy or it's a democratic face on it. But yes. Is it is it actually giving democratic effect? Not necessarily. Or right. not, I, I think that's. Supposed yeah, to. I think that's the point that that I'm trying to make, and it's. If we, if we look at the statistics in terms of how many people go out and vote for their MPs, I don't think a lot of people do. I know a lot of my friends don't. Um, mm. I, if, you, if you hear about European elections, they never really have been so, so heavily broadcasted across the country. European elections, the turnout's abysmal, <laughs> even compared to national elections. And I think, I think when, you, when you then consider that the European Union does have elements of it that can control our laws and some aspects of our democracy, yeah. one, would, one would naturally think that, well, European elections should actually be taken mm. just as seriously mm. as elections to members of parliament. Yeah. Um, and I don't think at the moment that's the case. And, uh, and I think that uh, a lot of people now are starting to see that. So. Mm. And you also have to ask yourself the question then, why? Uh, why is that the case? Why mm. are they not taken more seriously? And I think it's a reflection of the fact that you know, it's quite distant. It's quite remote. Yes, and I think I guess on one point, um, I, I'm, I'm sort of going to note the fact here that uh, all three of us have an IT background. Um, <laughs> I would not say that democracy scales well, if you take my point, ah. beyond a certain point. Mm. So you're getting to the core design of the European Union there, because the European Union is taking a union like the United Kingdom and then like, times it by ten. You know, <laughs> the, the, the trouble is when you have this argument that, you know. If I say it doesn't scale well, then you end up having to say, well, wh where is the unit? What is the ideal? Yeah. Because the opposite side of that is people then say, oh, well, we could work all the way back down the other way. Why don't we have low town hall democracy? And everything is decided on, on the basis of yeah. that. For me, the nation state is the unit. And I base that on, you go back to the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, when it was first established that 
you know, because a lot of, at, at that time you had a lot of, sort of feudal warlords and all that sort of thing uh, having wars around Europe. And it was first established at that time that when different armies, different forces were fighting one another, they were acting in the interest of what, what was the, the birth of the idea of the nation state. Yeah. And it goes all the way back to that, in Europe at least. But and isn't that I'm, the point of Europe, to, I, to avoid those wars? You know what I mean? Because that's, that's, oh, can you get on to sorry, that? Go on, go on. For me, when I look at how much has changed, I don't think that has fundamentally changed. The nation state is still the unit. What the European project is trying to do in Europe is change that and say it's not the unit anymore. Actually, the unit is the level of this. Yes. Um, in terms of wars, well, well we I, I, we I think I think you know the unit of uh, democracy mm. um, is open to debate. Mm. You know, and some people think that it should be the nation state. Some mm. people should it be even more. Um, what's the word? Um, push down mm. the principle of subsidi subsidiarity that the European Union claims to follow. Um, or some people think that it should be centralised to a technocracy in the centre. Mm. I think that debate can be had and, and it needs to be somewhere on that. And we're on one side and the, and the pro-European people are on the other side. But I think one of the reasons for the European Union it's, for it to be created was to try and prevent a third world war. You see what I mean? And, I th and because you were talking about the Treaty of Westphalia and these kind of warring factions that were kind of bounded by the, nas the nationalisms. And I would say that actually we can, political union is not required. Mm. A, a technocracy, a pan-continental technocracy mm. is not required to avoid a third world war. Absolutely. You know what I, mean? I think I, a, third, I a third world war can be avoided by um, strong trading links. I, 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 I was thinking just that actually just now. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, I think you could use the analogy of uh, uh, take a cul-de-sac street for example when you have I don't know ten houses on that cul-de-sac. Yeah. Do we need to remove all of those fences and all live sort of as one? An open plan street. <laughs> yeah, an open plan street as such should I say. Open plan neighbourhood. Although, you know I, I think that kind of the, that, that view is, is kind of like well yeah, take all of the fences down. We'll all live together. Everybody can just walk into each other's houses. You know, mm. oh, but if we don't have that, you know, we're going to have a war with each other. And you kind of think, well, if you narrow it down to, to, mm. to, that, to that side on a scale that people would understand, yeah. you kind of see, well, actually, it's not really true because mm. sometimes borders and sometimes fences, sometimes differences um, are needed and are and are a good can thing be positive, because yeah. people, uh, especially when you take uh, Europe, for example, it has a background of such different cultures. It's mm. not like the US West, the, the, the United States tends to be uh, United States in terms of they have very uh, high levels of similarity among one each other. So, yeah. so yeah. Some people would disagree with that, but, things, so, but, but I agree with yeah, you. Yeah. But, I think, I think there, but I think there are elements of that, mm, but yes, I think yep. in terms of comparing that to Europe, mm. the European member states of the European Union actually are still very different yes. to each other. So yep. if you go in through France uh, and then you travel across into Italy or you travel across to Spain or Germany, you see this, the, the huge change in culture. There is mm. a big change in difference. And I don't think fusing them together yes. in, the, in the way that the European Union has progressed or potentially wants to yeah. um, is always the best answer. And I actually fear now that it could create more divide. Mm. Um, yes. As we've seen with Brexit, people well, there, want to put barriers back up now. There's, there's yeah. an argument to say that it's a, well, essentially it's a one-size-fits-all model, mm. and we know why. You know, we know that one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. is a bit of a fantasy. It doesn't really work. There are these huge differences. That, as I say, as I sort of sort of mentioned before, when we consider change and things that have changed over time, it's also important to bear in mind in our thinking what has not changed. And what has not changed throughout all of the ever closer union that we've seen with the EEC and then the EU is the fact that these countries, as you say, are actually very different yes. in a lot of ways. That has not changed. But it's not just culture, right? I mean, mm. uh, for example, to take the Mediterranean countries, they've got completely different um, geostrategic and uh, political problems. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, for example, they've got a, a sea border which has got the other side of that, that's the Mediterranean Sea, you've got Northern Africa, yeah. right? And so some of the problems that these, these countries want to address, um, you could argue, are best dealt with by the people closest to those problems mm -hmm. rather than all the way in Belgium, you know, many thousands of miles yes. away. And, and I think there's actually an argument, to, I mean, as a, as a techie, I think in terms of bandwidth, right? And, yeah. and information flow. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, what, what do, 
what's the most scalable architecture? Mm. Well, it's a distributed architecture, isn't it? You don't have one massive, you don't go to Intel and say, give me the b biggest processor you've got and stick it in the biggest machine you've got. That's the kind of old fashioned mainframe solution. What we have nowadays is lots of tiny little phone, iPhones everywhere mining Bitcoin, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's kind of a massively distributed architecture. Mm. So actually the uni European Union is, is actually a, a very old fashioned model of a centralization that monolithic. was necessary. It's monolithic. Mm. It was necessary back in 1940 or whenever it was and because we didn't have iPhones. And we didn't have the web. We didn't have the, the, the high, high bandwidth fiber the ability optic network. to pick up your phone and speak yeah. to somebody in France or speak to your friends in Germany now. Exactly. And, and brings people closer together naturally. So I think you could argue actually technology is stopping wars and communication is stopping wars and people being able to communicate effectively and instantly with each other. Yeah. And, and it's also worth bearing in mind that the European Union is, is, or what led to the European Union, is not the only body that emerged in the aftermath of the Second World War, the no. UN, NATO, NATO, other yeah. factors there. But I think in if, we, if we're thinking analogies and th things that were, um, were needed then, this is an analogy I've used before of if you break your leg, and you have very little mobility, then you will, you will need to cast, you will need your crutches. And you will have your crutches, you will hobble around for a bit, but when your leg, and you need those at the mm -hmm. time so that you yeah. can move, but when your leg heals, yes. you no longer need them and you hand back the crutch, you hand back the cast, and that's supposed to be a happy day. Mm. But wouldn't it be a strange thing to do once your leg had healed to actually carry on hobbling around the place on the crutches? And I sort of view the European Union, and or rather the attitudes towards it, and this, the, the, the views behind it, as a bit like that crutch, you know, okay, so maybe in the aftermath of the Second World War, we needed a way of bringing Europe together. Fine. Do we need that now? Are we saying right. that we still need to rely on the crutch? And I guess what I'm saying is, if you want to say, call yourself progressive, as many people see the European Union as, no, progress is when you do not, as you say, require political union in order to avoid wars. But what I would say to that is that even if that analogy is not completely right, um, I think that, um, I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's that cold wind to us. It's, it's very cold. <laughs> it blows the thoughts. <laughs> um, Sorry, go on, it'll come back to me in a minute. <laughs> uh, I was done. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, I think um, Patrick was touching on the subject. I suppose you could um, say the European Union after the war uh, w was implemented to create that extra level of stability, perhaps stabilizers on a bike as such. Yeah, yeah. And now we've grown to a point where we don't need those stabilizers anymore. Um, we well, can Europe take them has, off and, yeah, yeah, um, yeah we are, sorry, as, as, as in the, Euro the continent of Europe, we don't need those stabilizers on the bike anymore. Yeah. We can take them off and continue balancing and cycling along right. the route that we have been doing. So. And that's sort of, yeah, I'm, 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 remember my point now mm. is that, um, you know, effectively what happened in 2016 was a change of mind, right? You know, we, we in, in 1975, we, we had an, uh, a view that we wanted to move towards a closer union. And there's some argument yes. about whether it was presented in a, in a truthful way because on the ballot paper it said common market, I think, mm -hmm. and that was possibly, arguably, not quite what was people would, were staying a, a member of. But um, I think, you know, we have to, if we're to live in a, a healthy society, um, live in a world where we can change course because yes. it's, not, it's not guaranteed that the course that, that we're set on um, uh, necessarily is the right course mm. 50 years down the line. You know what I mean? No one could have imagined the iPhone back in 1940. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, so, all, all, the, all the internet. And, and, and there's a way of saying, you know, that Brexit really is, is about choice and is, a, is about the ability to live in a world, I think, for me, in which these huge blocks are a choice, they're an option. They are yeah. not a necessity, they are not an inevitability. Mm. It is not the case that all roads lead to Brussels, you know, as we used to say, all roads lead to Rome in, in Europe. Because once that is the case, and it claims to stand for such very progressive values, and it's not, it's not, not, there aren't, it's not the case that it hasn't done good things, then you get a conflation in people's minds with this symbol of all those things actually becoming and embodying mm. the very notion of all of these wonderful progressive ideas. And once that's the case, it can do no wrong in the minds of a lot of people and to wield that when you wield that kind of power 
over hearts and minds because that is where power is exercised fundamentally. We can talk about courts, we can talk about legislatures, mm -hmm. we can talk about executives, but actually power, I'm going to get a bit biblical, if, if you wield the power to cause people to believe that you are the way, the truth and the life, John 14, 6 I believe, then you have created a true monopoly of the spirit. Now, from a Christian perspective, I would argue, well, that's appropriate for God, but nothing of mankind born should wield that power. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, I think what you're saying is it should be open to criticism. And, you know, effectively, 2016 was the biggest criticism of the European Union ever, right, in terms of the United Kingdom. And, and, and so and they we decided that, that it, was, it was worthy of criticism, mm -hmm. we criticised it, and that's a valid intellectual and ra rational position to hold. Absolutely, and you have to think about what would happen, I think, also, if we had voted to remain they would have seen it as a massive endorsement of everything they've done over the, over the past couple of decades. Yeah. And really that was, this is why Brexit is so necessary, because what was needed now is what happened, that we sent them the message that actually no, it is not the case that you can do whatever you want and people will always fall in line and you will always be able to, if they don't, mm. put, put them back down again and say, yes, you will go with what we're saying. Yeah. It is vital that this happens. You could argue that Brexit is more than about just Britain, more even than about Europe, then it's about the world. Mm. Because we have to have this message out there that if you are the fifth largest economy in the world, etc., 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 it's a choice and it's up to you. You can be in or out, and you know what? Either way, it will not be economic ruin. It will not be political suicide because I don't want to live in a world where that is not the case and this inevitability of these huge regional blocks is locked in. Mm. That is not a good world from my point of view. Far too much power centralised then with those blocks. I think and that never goes voice. well. I think that's a voice that's been replicated throughout human history, really. If you, if you take, uh, for example, there's, there's never been, uh, should we say, a successful empire. They've all collapsed in the end. Even the, yeah. even the British Empire, although dissolved peace peacefully, there has always been, people always seem to want to take back control, I think, as Boris Johnson put it in the, <laughs> in the referendum. Phrase. Yes. <laughs> so to take back control. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you, but you see there, as you say most astutely, all civilizations have their time. Mm. And you see towards the end of them, usually what you find is a level of decadence, a level mm. of corruption that I think is present at the, at the upper echelons of the European Union. You look at the appointment of Martin Zellmeyer. Uh, recently to that role that's now been criticised by... Martin Selma? Yes. Right. And um, what's his position I, now? I, 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 I'm actually, I'm sketchy on that one, but I, oh, remember, right. <laughs> I remember reading it. Uh, uh, you heard what the position was, but basically it's been investigated and it's been found to be not within the spirit of union law at all, but he's still there. Yeah. And the general revolving door that you have with Eurocrats, that's the kind of bureaucracy and the kind of corruption that you got towards the end of these empires. If you look at the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, mm -hmm. the Egyptians, you started to, started to see this sort of thing happening. But isn't so, that symptomatic of them being removed from the democratic grip? For example, you know, if, if it was a, an MP that had been somehow appointed by some shady means, then either that wouldn't have happened in the first place because they would have felt threatened by the electorate, or the electorate could have held them to account five well, years down the line. Well, the even election. in those older empires, there wasn't much in the way of democracy, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were essentially dictatorships. Mm -hmm. um, but. I mean, the, the corruption was coming about in a different way, yeah. not so much to do with whether it was direct democracy or not, because it wasn't anyway. But what we're seeing, I think now within the European Union, is something similar to that. And it's not just about Europe; it's also it's Western civilization in general that I would worry for. So yeah. Brexit is, as I think, as I think you mentioned earlier, there is a reset. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to show the world, well, that we're not locked on this course. We, large G7 countries, for example, we, we are not locked on this course. Mm. And there are alternatives, there are options, they can work, they are not the end of the world. That is the message from Britain to the world about Brexit. So we're all recharged with Dr Pepper, <laughs> Dr. Pepper and nicotine. So, um, yeah, so what are we talking about? Are talking about fear in Europe of a uh, no-deal Brexit or just a Brexit in No, general? well, I, I think um, the, the point that I was trying to make there was, um, and I think uh, Patrick was, was, was uh, agreeing, is that if we successfully leave, mm. 
uh, is it that the European Union then thinks that's such a huge risk for their project, uh, project sorry, that other countries, and I think this has been mentioned in the media before, may follow suit. Oh, I see. So therefore, it would, it would mean that the European Union, the Commission, loses that element of control, that element of power that they have currently over the established states, right. over those member states. Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of countries will see, if Britain can do it, then so can we. And when you look at that from a power point of view, mm. I mean, the, the analogy of the abusive relationship has been used before. And when I think about that, I'm mm. thinking about the use of language. When you think about this, this archetype of the abusive partner, the things that you hear them saying, you know, you can't go. You're nothing without me. You'll be nothing without me. Or, okay, fine, off you go, but you'll be mm. back. Now, that is exactly the sort of language that we've heard mm. coming out of Europe over these past couple of years. And you have to be careful, obviously, not to take this too far. <laughs> but so, I, just, I just look at that and I think the messaging has been, of course, you can't leave you know, successfully. But Juncker says Brexit cannot be a success. And maybe he meant may not be a success. We've had them saying... Britain will be much reduced without its membership of the EU. Okay, so you'll be nothing without me. <laughs> and then you have, mm. you know, well, you can leave, but you'll be back. Well, I forget whether it was Juncker or Tusk who said that, but that was, I think it was Tusk who was saying the British, we, we think they will rejoin in a few years' time and all that sort of thing. And I thought, I, I look at this behaviour and I spot some analogies mm. with almost a jilted partner here who. Yeah, it doesn't strike me as being the most healthy relationship um, and it's almost as though there's a willful blindness to that mm. um, in elements of the media and on the Remain side because and if, in that building. If, the European, <laughs> if the European Union was genuinely a project about collaboration mm. and friendly, friendly neighbourly, neighbourliness mm -hmm. then surely there would be like well a democratic decision has been taken in, in, in the United Kingdom. It was unfortunate but let's make the best of it. Mm. And perhaps in the future, because we, we're such good friends, maybe we'll, we'll end up closer together. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. Maybe there will be a, a change of heart in the future. Do you, do you but know, it's not been like that. They've actually doubled and tripled down on there. That makes me think of a very wise old phrase that I've heard before, which is, you, well, you see it on fridge magnets, so it must be wise and old. <laughs> if you love something, set it free. If it comes back to you, it's yours. If it doesn't, it was never meant to be. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that applies here very much. I, I think, yeah, I think so. I think what's sad as well, when you mention the media, um, there, there often seems to be, uh, I, I, think the, I think the media often focus on the European Union and they represent that as Europe. Mm. So what happens is you will get, well, actually, uh, your vote was actually, you know, you want to leave all of those countries and all of those mm. people and not actually the reasons I voted for to leave was actually because I don't like the political union that's been created. Mm. Not the fact that I don't like French people, that I don't like Spanish people. I have many friends from across Europe, many who also want to leave the European Union. Same here. Um, which is, you know, a, sh a strange concept to Remainers sometimes because they think, oh, well, no, if you, if you want to leave Europe, you must hate all Europeans. And you think, no, that's not true at all. And I think that the European Union has probably also set an image that they are Europe and not a union, mm. a European Union, a political organisation. That's, that's their something. aspiration, isn't it? There, there's they a want conflation that. there. Isn't mm. They want yeah, that yeah, conflation to be true. Yes. And, and if you if you repeat it often enough, it probably <laughs> well they hope it will become the truth. <laughs> and then and, and that leads us down a bit of a sad path where actually they're now creating some divide, uh, yeah. perhaps even some dislike. Um, because if that's true, then once Britain leaves, then we're not part of Europe anymore. Mm. You said to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. Officially, we, we still are part of the European. The we sit on the continent. <laughs> you know, the tectonic plates aren't going to change. Yeah. Um, we just don't we subscribe hope. to. Well, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> that'll be in. Uh, that'll be in the Remain campaign That's next. A doom, huge yes. earthquake. Earthquake yes. caused by Brexit. Yes. But, um, it's yeah. I think that. I think that there's a strong aspect of people trying to conflate Europe with the political union. Um, and I think that's actually damaging to the relationship between uh, British people and the people that they actually quite often do love across Europe and the cultures that we do love. Um, and I think that there needs to be more of an argument made to remove the perception that European Union is Europe because it's not, it's a political 
um, structure that manages and controls Europe. Yeah. It isn't actually Europe. I mean, I have a long history in the Netherlands mm -hmm. and still many friends over there and, and certainly they were um, surprised. Uh, yes. Perhaps a little nonplussed when <laughs> I told them how I had voted. Mm. Uh, I went, I went last, went last October. But it's not nonplussed, I, is it? Because nonplussed would be uh, kind of just like... <laughs> um, Relaxed about it, wouldn't it? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 to, I, 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 think, I think they were certainly <laughs> bemused by it, but but uh, right. really, that I, I went prepared yeah. because mm. I knew I was going to have to be um, in order to talk to people about this in a way that could try and make sense to them. Yeah, because it really is quite alien to a lot of people. Um, the way that I and many others chose to vote mm -hmm. in this country. And I think that it's, 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 it's symptomatic of what you're talking about then. It's the end result, it's the consequence yeah. of, it's what you see in the real world, of this conflation that has been going on uh, in people's minds over many decades. And that's right, and they, they, you're right. And, and, and kind of this kind of narrative has an impact on the continent with real people, where they mm. see it as a rejection of them. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and particularly the narrative about racism and, and, and nativism and ethno-nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, people in Europe are like, well, we hope we can still be friends. But of course, that's, that, that, that kind of plaintive cry is predicated on the fact that there's the, on the assumption that Brexit was a rejection of them when it isn't. It's a rejection of the supranational somebody structure on top of them. Somebody actually said that to me. Uh, a good, good friend of mine, we had a very long discussion about this and he said to me at the end, it's over in the Netherlands, sorry, well, you know, we, we, we can still be friends. Yeah. He meant me and him. But the, 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 the Because of this. The premise I mean, the is totally he, wrong. The fact that he the frame. mentioned that. Exactly. And I said this to him, the fact that you say that. You don't get it. The precedent has been set, hasn't it, in some ways, that, that, you know, if you're not part of this political union, then, you know, you're obviously not our friends. Yeah. And if you think, if you go back to the, um, the relationship analogy that you was using, that would indicate to me quite a toxic environment mm. in some ways. Yeah, um, it's when the mask slips. Yes. And, and you see that. And um, I think it is slipping, especially now. I think we're seeing, as Brexit has taken fold, I think we're now seeing Europeans. Um, there's a bit of a situation in France, and we've seen the media. <laughs> <laughs> we've seen, I'm going to understate it. We shan't touch you on that. We, sh and we shouldn't laugh, actually. No, but, we um, laugh. but you know, we, we're seeing now they're burning European flags in France. Mm, um, and I have, I have actually got Dutch friends who, um, well, I mean, the, the Dutch and the Belgians have a bit of a history around them socially, I think, where there's a little bit of know, competition and maybe, yeah. I wouldn't say dislike, but yeah, friction might be the, the It's almost the a sibling word. relationship in the, in the same yes. way that, that, that France and Germany have, and mm. other European, and we have with France, with Germany, and with other countries. There's this sort of sibling relationship that goes on. We don't always like each other, but we know each other very well. We live very close to one another. And you would hope ultimately we can pull together. Mm. And what we're saying is your way of pulling together is no longer going to be the way. There are going to be alternatives, there will be other ways of pulling together. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think that, that we have this choice. And there needs to be that choice. Mm. Um, you, you can turn, if you want to, you can turn this into a free market style argument. Um, you can talk about monopolies. The European Union, you could argue, has attempted to monopolize these progressive values, this notion of unity, this idea yeah. of peace, prosperity, freedom, but it's our way or the highway, mate. It, that's, that's what they're saying. And what we're saying is, actually, no, it isn't. Mm -hmm. And that is a role that, I'm not gonna get into this, but if you look, if you look at history, and our history of Europe in a certain way, that is a role that Britain has often played on the European stage. And you know what, here in, you know, in, the, in 2016, 17, 18, 19, in terms of what has and hasn't changed, well, that's not changed. We're doing the same thing again as we often have with Europe in the past.